In this video I want to give an overview of microservices. We won't show any code here, just do a little discussion. Microservices are often called a fine-grained services-oriented architecture. Services-oriented architecture, I first heard the word in the early parts of the 2000s, uh, right around the time we heard web services. It was essentially this idea that instead of building a self-enclosed application from the ground up where the database, the user interface, and the business logic was all tied together in one unit, we could build the services and then we could tie together the services and put the services together with a common user interface. So what are microservices? Well, there's a principle in Unix that says you should do one thing and do it well. And that's the idea with a microservice. Instead of giving all the information about a customer and a customer's date of birth and purchase history, we might just have one unit that is giving us customer's date of birth information or customer's purchase history information. Each of these would be an independent microservice that can be tied together. So Martin Fowler says, designing software application is suites of independently deployable services. So the entire application or the entire ecosystem is made of these suites of independent services. So they have automated deployment frequently, which means it's easy to make a change and then deploy them through the system without having to have a scheduled downtime window or anything like that. Endpoint intelligence. That means if we're trying to access something, we'll typically have an endpoint. An endpoint, uh, depending on where you start, it's typically something that starts after the domain name and a web address. So our endpoint here might be view plants JSON, and then uh, don't worry too much about the extension there. But what we're saying here is we want to view plants in a JSON format. That would be our endpoint. You could have an endpoint that's this entire unit, or depending on how you describe it, it could be just that last little nugget there. But nonetheless, the endpoint tells us what we are going to get in return. Now, decentralized control of languages and data. This is interesting. If we take a look at the endpoint that I just showed you, this is from plantplaces.com. And uh, if you recognize that PL extension, that means it's written in Perl, uh, uses a you know, database on the back end, a traditional SQL database. This is a common way to expose information, especially through a microservice, is just prevent, present some kind of JSON stream that's coming from a data storage mechanism under the covers. But we're not very concerned about what that data storage mechanism physically is. Is it a SQL database? Is it a NoSQL database? We're not really worried about that. We're also not very worried about the programming language that generated this JSON. We're concerned that it's JSON because we need to know how to parse it, but we're not so worried about the programming language that makes it. We just want to see the end product. Now, this concept of, of exhibiting services or exhibiting data uh, through microservices is really exploding in popularity now. And uh, there are many different reasons why. One of them is, though, I think that uh, we have these mobile applications that are able to integrate data from different sources. Or we have enterprise applications that can integrate data from different sources. Now take a look at this, the Cincinnati uh, Open Data Initiative. This is something you see in a lot of cities where they offer publicly available data that describes the city. So we could say building permit, permit contracts. I'm just picking one out at random here. I click on the uh, API documents here. And I navigate down a little description here and then a link to get me started. I click on the link and take a look at what we have here. We have some kind of publicly available JSON data. Now, do we know about the data storage mechanism under the covers? No, we don't. Do we know about the programming language used to generate it? No, we don't. We just get this in JSON data that we could integrate together uh, with other things. If you're thinking of a good idea for an application, a lot of times I just like starting with the data. Uh, when I teach the intro to mobile classes, a lot of times we'll go in here and somebody will find something like a, 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 the uh, health ratings of restaurants, the health and safety ratings. And they could integrate that with something like a restaurant review site. So not only are the burgers good, but you can have some confidence that the kitchen is clean as well. So a lot of opportunity here to integrate data together and come up with information. So data is just stuff. Information is what we do with that stuff. And that's a big principle behind microservices as well. So what are some principles of microservices? 
Well, in some ways, I'll say it's a buzzword because there really aren't any official standards. But on the other hand, if you say microservice to a fellow developer, that developer will probably say, oh yeah, I know what you mean, or at least I get the gist of what you mean. Some kind of independent data or some kind of independent uh, information that I can aggregate together. We use some lightweight mechanisms like HTTP, which has built in several different protocols like get, post, delete, put, uh, several others like that that we can just use as they are. Spring Boot is really designed for microservices. We'll have more on that in a separate video, but that's where we can say, you know what, I want to make a service with minimal configuration that's going to access this kind of data store. So the services are typically independently deployable, and that's an advantage of them all having a different data storage mechanism. Because with that separate data storage mechanism, we don't have to worry about relations with other data storage mechanisms. In the old days, we'd build these, build these monolithic applications that all used the same database. And the trick there is, if you change the structure of that database, you have to upgrade everything. So it was kind of like one centralized point of configuration, but if the structure of that configuration changes, it changes everything which is a difficult conversation to have sometimes because it can be very expensive to do that. Services are designed around capabilities. We'll see an example of that in a slide that's coming soon where we could have a Bureau of Motor Vehicles. When you, when you uh, re-register your driver's license or your license plate, uh, all the different data sources that it has to access, we can build services around these capabilities. It's easy to remove one of these services and replace it with something newer without affecting the others. And then we also embrace continuous testing and delivery because we're really living in small units, not one entire big unit. So we have to ensure that we are testing properly and also that we can continuously deliver as our needs change. So here's the way we used to design applications, or we still do in many ways. This is a traditional enterprise application. What we'll have is some kind of database tier down here. So it could be a single database or could be multiple databases. With enterprise applications, we typically would choose one database vendor, uh, say IBM, Oracle, or Microsoft SQL Server. And then we would have a very relational database model underneath the covers. In other words, we might have a table called, say, customers, or let's say, let's use our driver example again. We might have a, a, a table called drivers, and then we might have a table called license plates, and another table called vehicles, and maybe another table uh, called organ donor. And then the database's job is to put all these together by joining them together. Next, we have some kind of business tier that's our, our Java logic around some enterprise beans that says, okay, if the driver is under 18 but over 16, we issue a portrait version of the driver's license versus the landscape version. So a police officer can quickly see that this is an underage driver. Or even more importantly, I, I don't know more importantly, but a checkout clerk can say, okay, you're not old enough to buy certain restricted items like alcohol and tobacco. So that would be some logic that we would put in this business tier. How to format the driver's license based on the user's age. Now we have a web tier, which is where we're doing some kind of user interface. Uh, so we're putting together some templates and some HTML. We're putting these all together. And then finally, some kind of application tier where we might have jQuery or JSON running, something that the user actually sees. Now the trick is, this is all dependent on this common database with a relational model. So this is where if we upgrade the database, it could have downstream effects on everything above it. Don't get me wrong, this is a perfectly good model, and it's a model that's used very frequently. It does have advantages and disadvantages, so I don't mean to completely say it's all full of disadvantages, because this is actually a model we see very frequently today. But that golden nail of the database that holds everything together, the fact that we cannot uh, just update it for update the schema for one thing but not the rest, or in other words, if we change the structure, everything changes, that became a big limiting factor because we'd have to really coordinate any changes to the structure of the database with the entire application that sits on top of that database. That's something that could have a long development cycle. 
So we went from there to microservices, where we're not looking at putting all of the data into the same place, but we're really looking at getting the data wherever it might happen to live and then making use of that data. So consider the different data feeds that we would need uh, if, we are, if we are the Bureau of Motor Vehicles. So we might have some state residence database. So who are the residents of our state? Uh, maybe we have tax forms or something like that where we can say, uh, yes, we verified that this driver is a resident of our state. Uh, I'll use my home state of Ohio as an example while we're doing this. Now in Ohio, when you sign up for a driver's license, uh, a lot of times you'll say that you want to volunteer to be an organ donor. In the unfortunate case of your death, if you have organs that are worth harvesting and that are still harvestable, uh, they can provide that to somebody else who needs the organ to continue to live. So we need a database of, of verified organ donors, but that probably doesn't really belong in the same database where we're storing tax records, does it? Okay, then we also need some kind of database for the Bureau of Motor Vehicles to say when this person came in to register his or her car, what the license plate number is, so on and so forth. That might be a separate database. Now, before we can issue a driver's license, we have to make sure that the driver is eligible to drive and does not have a suspended license. Uh, we also might want to check court records. So we might have a county court record database on a legacy system. We might have a cloud provider of state court records. Additionally, we don't want to issue a driver's license or a license plate unless the driver has provided proof of insurance. So we might need to reach out here to some insurance companies. Now look at all of these different sources of data. Consider how you would have to aggregate them in an enterprise application. That's going to be very difficult because somehow we're going to have to keep all that data here in our database and we're going to have to keep it updated and synchronized. And that can get really difficult because how do we know when court records change? How do we know when insurance records change? Instead of trying to make a copy and manage that locally, we should really just go out to the source of data and get it from there. So let's take this framework of different places where we can retrieve data or store data and let's consider how microservices might work. These are the same data points that we had before, just a little bit reorganized, but you see that essentially we have different swim lanes. And I, I didn't draw them out as parallel lanes, but we have different swim lanes on how we can access the data. So we have some kind of driver's license user interface and we probably need some kind of logic behind here like a Java class or something that's going to actually aggregate the data together. But nonetheless, you see the state legacy database where they have tax records. Maybe it's on a mainframe, maybe we have COBOL, and then we expose it with an HTML endpoint. An a, sorry, an HTTP endpoint rather. Our organ donor, let's build a new microservice around that. So here maybe we have an existing application we just put a microservice on top of. For the organ donor, a completely separate microservice. Notice it doesn't have lines going to the left or the right. We just have a little server here sitting on top of a little Mongo database, some kind of NoSQL database. Cassandra is another good example of a NoSQL database. And we can stand this up completely independent of all of our other microservices. Now the Bureau of Motor Vehicles for tracking who they've issued driver's licenses to and when license plates are about to be expired, they might have a microservices here, a microservice here, and maybe that uses a traditional SQL-based uh, database. Now the clerk of courts, maybe they have an XML endpoint here, and maybe there's some kind of aggregation server here that can talk to the state court records in the cloud and the county court records on a legacy system. And this is an example I'm making this up. Uh, probably it looks really like this in real life, but I'm not sure. Just making it up. Now the insurance companies, for them it's going to be easiest to just give us an HTTP endpoint that gives us something like the JSON data that I showed you earlier, instead of them actually building integration all the way to us. So you see, the common thread here is that everybody is exposing an endpoint, and under that endpoint is a microservice. Uh, the storage mechanism, the programming language, can differ from one microservice to another. The job of this user interface then, and the classes, the, the actual Java code behind it, is to take these endpoints and mix them together and make a full application out of it. So in the old days of enterprise applications that were monolithic, 
we'd use the SQL query to join together records by some kind of primary key and foreign key. In the new days of microservices, a lot of times we'll use a business key to say, here's who this person is. So driver's license, if you look on your driver's license, you typically have a driver's license number. That could be a, uh, a business key that ties all these together. Or it might be a social security number if we're looking at uh, state uh, income tax records, something like that. Also could be a social security number if we're looking at court records. But nonetheless, the aggregation happens several layers up in a microservice as compared to a traditional monolithic application where that joining happens at the database level. While, it, while that's a different level of doing aggregation, it also gives us all of the flexibility that I've mentioned to date. So microservices are independently deployable, oftentimes with automatic deployment, can use different languages, different storage mechanisms, different uh, architecture. They join data typically with business keys at a higher up layer than down at the data storage mechanism. They're independently scalable, scalable, and that's a big one I didn't mention earlier. So think about this, organ donation, how often is that database going to get hit? Probably not a whole lot, but what about this insurance information? Uh, if you consider that insurance is really a national thing, not a state thing, there are lots of Bureau of Motor Vehicles that are going to need to access that. So by independently scalable, what we mean is we can put this on something like Pivotal Cloud Foundry or Kubernetes or something like that, where essentially we say, uh, put this on a virtual server, virtual machine. When that starts to run low on capacity or when it hits a certain threshold, automatically spin another one up and another one and another one and another one to handle this capacity. Uh, so that's really nice here because you see this guy can scale independently of all the others over here. In the monolithic days, we would oftentimes have to scale this entire unit as one piece. But in the microservice days, we can scale each microservice independently, which is a major advantage. And then these can be developed by different groups. Again, as we saw up here, uh, the state income tax system, the state court system, or maybe the county court system, the insurance companies, and then also the Bureau of Motor Vehicles. Okay, that is a big thing. If you're looking for uh, something that's really trending in information technology today, this is it. Really, I will say over most of my career, uh, a lot of time I have spent just integrating things. And the idea here is we're making that integration much easier. You'll hear this word called service mesh uh, occasionally. This is what's also called a reverse proxy, which is where we might get something in at a certain endpoint, then we have to decide where to send that request. So it's how we will discover services, how we will communicate with other services. Also, how we I'll save load balancing for just a moment. We'll come back to that. How to authorize and authenticate our users and how to handle secure communications. These are all things that can be done with this thing called a service mesh. Now, load balancing, that's an important concept. Let's go back to our insurance example earlier. We know that this one can scale up as needed. And so a lot of times what will happen is we'll get a lot of requests in here uh, when we have heavy demand. Let's say that states require you to renew your driver's license by the end of your birth month, by the, the, the last day of your birth month. In that case, there's going to be a whole lot of demand on this system at every end of month. So what we might do is we might put a load balancer on either side of this endpoint and the load balancer just uh, tries to keep literally the load balanced across multiple instances. So let me take a step back. You remember that I said we can independently scale microservices. That means we could have one physical server or virtual server running this. We could have 12 and it can even in some cases automatically to figure out how many we need. Because these 12 different instances are identical, we need something like a load balancer sitting out front to decide where to send requests. So in other words, what's the use of having 12 servers if all the requests are only going to one server? You want to make sure that that load is evenly distributed, and that's where a load balancer comes in. So that is a look at microservices. I hope this video has been helpful. Curious about your thoughts? Please place them down in the comments. Thank you.